Hi, everybody. I want to, before I even start, I just want to say thank you to you, both of you guys for organizing yes. this event and to NYU for hosting this incredible evening. Uh, I had no idea that we were going to pack an auditorium of this size. A lot of so let's give a hand for coming up tonight. This is remarkable and amazing. And I think it's a really powerful testament to where we're at in this movement. <clears throat> we're at this tipping point, this truly global tipping point where uh, popular mainstream society has never been more open to these ideas. And whether your entry point is health or the environment or ethics or something, something else, it doesn't matter. Like there is an incredible amount of energy and enthusiasm around this movement. It just makes me so proud to be up here uh, and, and to participate in a small way in, in what's going on. So thank you for that. Um, my name is Rich Roll. I'm an ultra endurance athlete, uh, triathlete. Uh, most people don't know what that is. It basically means that uh, I'm not very fast, but I can kind of keep going all day long, uh, whether it's biking, swimming, or running. Um, and I have, a, you know, I, I have, I guess, a, a fairly interesting um, origin story when it comes to uh, becoming vegan and adopting a plant-based diet. Uh, I, you know, was raised on a traditional, the traditional American diet. Uh, I was a workaholic. I'm also a recovering alcoholic. And, you know, in, my, in the years leading up to my 40th birthday, I'd packed on 50 pounds. I was just, you know, a corporate lawyer doing the grind. And it really all caught up to me shortly before I turned 40 um, when I had a, a sort of an episode on, on, on the staircase up to my bedroom where I had to pause going up a simple flight of stairs. And you know, I'd been an athlete in college, I was a swimmer. Um, I'd always walked around believing that I still was like, you know, fit like a college swimmer, even though I was 40 years old and, and fat and lazy and basically a couch potato. And I had this moment of clarity about how I was living my life. And, and that really was the first moment uh, that set in motion everything that has transpired to you know, bring me up to the stage tonight. But, you know, essentially, I had a very messy, uh, you know, six months of playing around with different diets and trying to find a way to eat that would make me feel better uh, than I was feeling at the time, and really stumbled into eating a vegan diet almost by accident and by virtue of trying everything else first. Like it, it was not like I wanted to become a vegan or this was something that I was magnetized to, um, but when I tried it, it agreed with me so completely and so undeniably that. It really uh, um, encouraged me to educate myself and learn more about why suddenly my body felt and was performing so much better eating nothing but plants when my whole life I'd been taught beef is what's for dinner and milk is what does a body good. Like the idea of becoming a vegan like inverted my whole entire world view. Uh, and I think you know something that I analogize it to is sort of like taking the red, the red pill in the matrix. I think it's the red pill, right? Mm -hmm. It's the blue pill or the red pill. I think it's the red pill. And suddenly I started to question everything around me, all these um, paradigms and, and conventional ideas that I just accepted as truth and reality, um, I started to look at differently. And although my entry point into eating a plant-based diet was health, and eating a plant-based diet, becoming vegan, certainly revitalized me in more ways than I could have possibly imagined. Uh, I've now become equally, if not more, interested in the environmental implications and the ethical implications of, of, of the food choices that we make and uh, the political activism that is how we use our dollar to, uh, to feed ourselves. And I think it's a very powerful thing, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it tonight. Um, but to kind of wrap up, I don't know how long I've gone, probably five minutes, You can keep right? going. Yeah, well, listen all night. Yeah, well, <laughs> essentially, becoming a vegan has changed for the better every aspect of my life. Not only did I lose 50 pounds, it fueled me through some crazy endurance challenges that I never would have thought capable, achieving uh, athletic feats in my mid-40s that I would have thought impossible in my 20s. Uh, and it's really allowed me to, again, perceive the world differently in terms of what our personal limits are and what our, our, our power is as individuals to influence and impact not only our own health, but the world around us at large. So that's it. Thank you so Thank much. You. David. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. 
All right, cool. So my name is David Carter, also known as 300 Pound Vegan. That's my superhero name. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, just like, uh, just like this guy, I started out eating meat like everybody else. Uh, my family even owned a barbecue restaurant. So it was like all day, every day for me, it was like pounds of meat all day. Anyways, uh, and my brother, my brother and I both played sports growing up, so it was like a competition to see who can eat the most meat, who can get the most protein, because we were brainwashed like everybody else, thinking meat and dairy were the only sources of protein, and that's what I'm going to eat to get as big and strong as we possibly can. And all of that caught up to me. It worked. I was 300 pounds, 300 plus pounds, and got into the NFL, and it worked and everything. But it caught up to me my third year in NFL, where I started having old man diseases. I started coming down with, uh, I, came, I, got, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. Uh, they gave me medication for that. Uh, they gave me Medicaid, and that was actually while I was in college. Uh, tendinitis, early onset arthritis, uh, nerve damage. I couldn't feel my right hand. I had to tape some fingers to other fingers just so they wouldn't get, get hyperextended or broke off while I was playing. And, uh, <laughs> At a point, at, when it, you know, after a while, it's like, well, you know, I can't continue to live my life like this. You know, I'm 23 with all of these old man diseases and a list of medications and, uh, and anti-inflammatories and painkillers. And it's like, that's just, that shit's just not right. And uh, so uh, my wife, she had been vegan for six years before me while we were together the whole time. And I was just like, oh, you know, that's good. You know, you can keep that, you know. <laughs> uh, that's just the, just the regular male response, you know, especially a male athlete response is, you know, you can keep that, that vegan diet to yourself, you know, I don't want to get weak, I don't want to get small, and, and uh, you know, after we watched uh, Forks Over Knives on the day before Valentine's Day, and that movie just changed my life, the documentary just changed my life, and for those of you who don't know, the documentary Forks Over Knives, it just, it, it compares, you know, what's more, what's more crazy, eating a healthy diet or going under the knife for surgery, you know, like, it, it's, it's a, you have to really educate yourself on um, what a healthy diet actually is because a lot of people have this assumption, oh, lean chicken or lean beef or something, that's what a healthy diet is. And that's, what I, that's the approach that I took. I'm gonna start eating leaner and none of that worked out. I still suffer from tendonitis and early onset arthritis and all of these things. And you know, once I went vegan, I lost weight too. In the, four, in the first month, I lost 40 pounds. And, uh, but when I lost the weight, all of my strength and everything else went up. My bench press was, because of the tendonitis and the early onset arthritis, I can only bench press 315 pounds and for five. And then after I went vegan, I lost oh the 40 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not, that's not a lot for me, but after I went, <laughs> after I went vegan, I, and a month later, you know, it took me some work and I was working hard, but I was like, man, I'm losing weight. I lost 40 pounds, I got down to 260. And I was like, shit, you know, I got to get this weight back on. But my bench press, I wasn't really too worried because my bench press went from 315 for five and I was bench pressing over 450. And, and I was like, well, uh, <laughs> I feel really good right now. So, but, um, you know, so like that, like the same thing that happened to him, you know, I continued to, I continued the vegan diet, the vegan lifestyle. It's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. And you know, everything just continued to get better. My speed incre increased, uh, strength increased. I was sleeping better at night. Uh, I, I realized that, you know, what I was doing before just wasn't healthy and it wasn't right. And I was using Band-Aids to cover up things that I should have been uh, handling from the root. You know, I should have been handling uh, from the source. And uh, I mean, the plant-based diet is the uh, lifestyle. Lifestyle, plant-based lifestyle is the best thing that has ever happened to me. Uh, and then, yes, I did start for health reasons, but then the ethical and environmental reasons just came into play when I realized that, you know, I don't really need to, t I don't need to take a life at all to survive in this world. Uh, why does another animal have to suffer through pain for me, for, for, my, for my selfish reasons? You know, that's glutton, and you know, I don't need to do any of that. I just need to live my life. I can wear hemp clothes and be totally fine and not have another per animal have to die for me. So that's, that's it, I guess, right? Thank you so much, David. So now the only real doctor on the panel <laughs> is up, Dr. McMacken. So uh, I'm an internal medicine doctor, and I practice at Bellevue Hospital and NYU School of Medicine here in New York. 
Uh, I want to start by just clearing up any confusion about my athletic abilities. Because <laughs> I know it looks like I can crush these guys in any competition, but, uh, but actually my sport is the sport of medicine. And, uh, and my uh, medical understanding about how our food choices uh, can lead us to optimal health and performance. Um, to give you guys a little background, I didn't always want to be a doctor. In fact, I was an English major and studied English literature in college. Woo! And <laughs> <laughs> humanities. And uh, I made my way down to Atlanta after, after college and became a writer editor at the Centers for Disease Control. And it was there that I discovered I had a passion for public health, and I made what at the time seemed like a really crazy decision to go to medical school. So I had to go back and take all of the pre-med science classes. Hadn't taken any science classes yet. And uh, I was actually quite surprised to find out that I liked science. <coughs> and when I started my medical training, I also realized I had a passion for interconnectedness and understanding how things join together. So I decided to pursue a specialty in internal medicine, which is a field of medicine where you kind of learn how to connect the dots between different organ systems. So rather than just focusing deeply on one organ system or performing surgeries, you actually learn how everything comes together and is connected. And you're really looking at the whole person, the whole patient. Uh, so in my primary care practice now, I treat uh, and prevent uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, dementia, heart disease, gout, kidney disease, strokes, cancer, and the list goes on. And what you might be sitting here thinking is, you know, that, that's a lot of different stuff to treat. But in reality, as you guys have already alluded to, it all has a common root. And that root is diet. It's our food choices. It have a lot of bearing on, on our chronic disease risk. So I actually really began the first part of my career practicing a very traditional type of medicine where I would offer emphasized pills and procedures and surgeries. Uh, for every medical condition, I promise you, a pill exists. And you, know, I, you can write 25 prescriptions in, in one office visit. Uh, I would give lip service to lifestyle medicine. I would give lip service to f diet and exercise, but I wouldn't really integrate it into my practice. At the same time, I was actually undergoing my own uh, sort of personal transformation at this point in my career because I had been a vegetarian since I was 13 years old. Um, but it wasn't until about eight or nine years ago that uh, I had an awakening when it came to dairy and eggs. And uh, quite frankly, I don't think I had really, I hadn't made the connection up until that point uh, how, you know, what, what happens to animals in those industries. And once I sort of let that information in, it, it just wasn't, for me, it wasn't possible to keep participating in that. And uh, it, it just, it really wasn't in line with my core values of not causing harm and practicing compassion. So um, those are really the same values that led me to med school in the first place. So, you know, for me, Compassion is compassion, and I felt like I had to extend it beyond <coughs> my office exam room um, to the rest of my life and really incorporate a lifestyle that, that um, reduced harm in any way that I, that I could. And especially when something was so simple as my food choices um, could have so much impact, so I decided to go vegan. Around that time, uh, I started, after that, undergoing an, then a professional transformation because at this, this was around the time that Forks Over Knives was coming out, um, the China study was published, and there was a lot of evidence around uh, the, sci the scientific evidence around the benefits of plant-based diets. So as I was reading more and more about it and going to a couple of key medical conferences, I really decided I've just got to transform my practice. I've got to start using food as medicine. And that's what I did. I, uh, I also at the same time received a grant to actually study evidence-based nutrition. So what's been published in the literature around different nutritional strategies? What are the healthiest ways to eat? And what does the science say? and take that information and develop a curriculum to teach my fellow doctors about nutrition, which as you guys know is a subject that's really woefully underemphasized in medical training. So in promoting plant-based eating, um, I'm really, at this point, what I feel like I'm doing is helping my patients get to the root cause of their illness. And um, 
it, it's not so much that I'm treating symptoms anymore. I'm actually getting to what's, what's really going on underneath. And from the most selfish standpoint, I have to say that it's transformed my own fulfillment with my practice. I feel more rewarded than I've ever felt before. And um, I'm saving animals and hopefully helping the planet at the same time. So it's really a, it's a big win. Um, and for me, again, just going back to the interconnectedness, it's really about how we all are sort of linked together and we're intertwined. Um, it's, you know, true health is not just about our individual food choices and our individual lifestyle practices. To me, it's really about a collective consciousness about uh, how we treat everyone on the planet, all the living beings on the planet and the planet itself. Thank you so much, Michelle. <laughs> Dominic, you're the only one left. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Dominic Thompson, and um, I guess the reason my journey started a little bit different than everyone up here. I, um, I um, as a kid, I was one of those kids that always questioned everything that was put in front of me, whether it was any any type of food that was put in front of me. I'll give you a prime example. My mother used to feed us uh, chicken wings, <laughs> a lot of chicken wings, uh, growing up in Chicago. I'm originally from Chicago, West Side, uh, and one of the most um, uh, rough neighborhoods out there. But anyway, she used to feed us these chicken wings, and um, I would always push back, like, I, I, I don't want this. It, I had a problem with digging into the wings itself, these veins that I've seen in, this, in the chicken wings. And I always questioned her, but I was like, what, what is that? And she wouldn't tell me. And <laughs> true story, she'll tell you that, too. <laughs> she wouldn't tell me. And it got to a point where I just stopped eating. I, I was like, I don't want it anymore. And um, uh, so she, she got smart and started feeding me chicken breast. <laughs> uh, the breast, as you know, hides some of the, uh, the body parts of the chicken and where that meat is attached. So, uh, so I started eating that, but I will even question that to a point. But I, this was at an early age. This was, I was probably six uh, when I started questioning my mother. I was just one of those kids that just didn't feel right. It felt something funny in my stomach about eating meat. So as I got older, um, you know, I went through the stages. I started playing football, you know, uh, in Chicago. I was pretty good at it, and um, I did my thing with that. Uh, but I would even question um, anything that was put in my plate um, at that time. But um, I think what what happened with me that really started that that um, uh, that transformation was that fact that I kept ignoring. As you, you know, as kids, you go get out, you get older, and you get busy, you run the streets, and you do all these different things with your friends, and you get involved in academics and, and, and sports and stuff like that. And I'm sure David remember those days playing high school football. But you get really, really busy, and you you don't really consciously think about what's happening in the world. And for me, I think I kept pushing that to the side. And I think once you realize what you're doing is wrong, you have to address that issue. And since I kept ignoring that issue, um, my world, as I got older, started really uh, a lot of negative energy, a lot of negative things was happening for me. Uh, and I hit a dark point in my life um, um, when I was 22. I, I hit rock bottom with some situations because uh, I felt like I kept ignoring the fact that I was doing harm um, to uh, uh, not only myself, but to different things in this planet. Um, and it's a very, it's something that I'm gonna talk, talk, talk to you guys about um, later on in this future, but it was, it was a serious situation that happened to me when I was 22. Um, and uh, that started really everything uh, changed for me from that point on. Uh, so uh, going backwards, so yeah, uh, I always knew that meat was not for me. And when I became 22, and I hit that situation, I kind of summed things up that everything was going wrong in my life is because I kept on ignoring the fact that I'm doing wrong to my community, I'm doing wrong to these animals, I'm contributing to things in society that's just something I should not be a part of. Uh, and I promise you, when I made that decision then, I'm 37 now, when I made that decision when I was 22, everything for me went 360. Um, my career, uh, um, everything, my health, all of that. Um, and I stopped eating meat. And I just knew it wasn't right, um, and um, I never looked back. I, I was a vegetarian. I started off as vegetarian. Like everyone else, you don't know, you don't realize that milk and dairy and eggs, the damage that's done in the industries is, if not worse than what's happening in the meat industry. Um, and I was probably one, I was a bigger activist as a vegetarian than I was a vegan. <laughs> 
which is strange. Uh, but you know, you go down that rabbit hole and you, you continue to learn and everything about the industry, and that's what happened. So. Uh, yeah, so that's why I became, I became vegan. I, I would say I was always in tune and conscious about what's happening in the world at an early age, but again, when I became 22, that's when I really just cut things off um, with uh, contributing any, I cut all negativity out of my life, uh, including the people I was hanging out with, um, um, everything, and that's when things started to really excel for me. So that's, that's a little bit of my story. Thank you so much, Don. So this panel started uh, as a series of ideas, vaguely about a panel, and then we started coming together at uh, Environmental Studies, the Animal Studies Initiative, and the Center for the Humanities. And um, the panel grew in size, uh, and the celebrity status went up in voltage, but the resources didn't necessarily. So we have to thank these guys for coming out um, on a shoestring budget. It was, it's really a work of, um, or a testament to their passion and their commitment to a number of really important issues. Um, so thank you all so much, very, very much. So I look out at the audience and I see it's very diverse and some of you uh, I know personally, I'm looking at a woman who's gonna run across the USA, Kayla, raise your hand. She is so embarrassed right now. <laughs> she went vegan for just a little bit and then might go vegan still, but as somebody who is also really engaged in thinking about like what does it mean to be vegan, what does it mean to fuel your body as a vegan, we thank you all for signing waivers when you came in uh, or uh, promises to go vegan. Thank you all so much. <laughs> We're very excited by that. Uh, <laughs> there's a gentleman here who owns a press that puts out largely um, well books about veganism. Martin, you're also going to be embarrassed. Where are you? Martin Rowe, there you are. Uh, they don't know that this is going to happen, by the way. Uh, that's it. Everyone else can relax now. Um, Martin uh, does amazing work and puts out uh, books that other presses might pass over. Um, and so I'm just thinking about, you know, other people who I won't name that own vegan restaurants in the audience or are from Wall Street or are partners at law firms that are considering going vegan or colleagues of mine on the 12th floor of Bobst who are thinking of going <laughs> vegan because administrators are amazing people, actually. Uh, so, uh, I just think, like, there's something really interesting about that because I was told, like, wow, you guys, um, I think it was one of my students said, oh, it seems like you know everyone in the vegan community, and I thought, no, it's just that it's a pretty engaged community, you know, we are very active, um, and so it struck me that it's not that it's small, but that it's powerful, uh, and galvanizing, and it's, uh, really an honor to be a part of that. Hey there. Um, so, um... I think that with that thought, I was going to ask the question, the first question, why did you go vegan? They all answered that. We're not going <clears> to <throat> make you review that. But um, this event is particularly also about animals. And so I really do want to know, um, you know, there are three main factions. I didn't know this when I went vegan. We're all vegan on stage. Um, I didn't know this, that there are different camps. You know, I thought everyone was going vegan for the same reasons I went vegan. And then I found out, oh, some people go vegan because they're allergic, they have migraines, um, and then they sort of fall into a vegan diet, right? So they're a, a plant-based uh, vegan who's focused on the health benefits, and that comes along with other um, uh, implications of what they watch in terms of their uh, intake. Like, I'm probably to them a junk food vegan. Uh, <laughs> uh, then there are people who go for environmental and sustainability reasons that really believe that it is the answer. And Elizabeth Colbert, who was one of the first speakers uh, in the Environmental Humanities series, uh, you know, she was asked a number of questions about the ag, uh, ag business and agricultural industry and what the implications are for climate change. And that's not really um, something that she necessarily is speaking to, but vegans would and do. Um, and so that's a second camp, is that the environmentalists and sustainability and climate change reversal uh, uh, belief, or a uh, belief in climate change reversal. Um, and then the third is the animal rights. So you have really these three, I think, larger groups, I would say, um, that are, uh, that overlap, but are the main sort of uh, contingents of, uh, uh, veganism. So my question for the four of you is, wh how do animals, what role do animals play in being plant-based or vegan? Um, and 
did it change other practices of consumption? So maybe you've started at first thinking, okay, if I don't eat dairy, then I know that calves won't be slaughtered. I'm doing right by animals. But then you think, wow, I'm wearing a leather jacket. Oh no, what, what does that mean? Or what are my shoes that, that I train in, right? Like what kind of athletic wear do I wear? So Rich, I'm gonna start on your end again, if you don't mind, just addressing what role or relationship to animals does your veganism have? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, my relationship to that issue is very different today than it was uh, when I began this journey, and I alluded to that in my mm -hmm. introduction. I mean, when, when, you know, when I began, for me, it was about my personal health. That was the equation that I was trying to solve. You know, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, and the kind of pain and fear of continuing to live the way that I was living uh, exceeded, you know, the, the pain and fear of trying something different that was outside of my comfort zone. Uh, but that experiment, um, once I kind of figured out uh, the diet aspect of it, was so profound, um, and like I said earlier, it really did uh, lead me to question all sorts of things about how our, our culture and our society functions. Um, and it's, it was inevitable, of course, that this would lead me to you know, the ethical arguments that surround veganism and the horrific and horrible way that we you know, treat these, these creatures. Uh, and when you start to learn about how factory farming operates and you begin to really uh, contemplate and understand the regulatory and legislative structures around these gigantic industries that are supported by you know, massive lobbying uh, groups that influence politics and the, the kind of infrastructure that's in place to, to protect uh, these institutions and prevent the public from really understanding what's going on, it becomes impossible to not want to delve deeper into that and, and truly understand, you know, what is at stake and, and how this functions. And so that, you know, inevitably led me towards a much more compassionate perspective um, about animals uh, and the animal rights issue itself. And to answer your question specifically, it has profoundly impacted uh, my consumer choices uh, outside of what's on my plate. You know, when you begin to learn about fashion, it's very similar mm -hmm. to food. You know, fast fashion is an epidemic that's, you know, raping this planet and, and, and is, you know, equally or on some level responsible for, you know, maiming and killing millions and millions of animals on a mass, you know, uh, on a mass scale that, that becomes indefensible to me. And, mm -hmm. And you know, unlike unlike veganism, as with respect to food, I think veganism with respect to clothing choices and fashion choices, it's a little bit behind. Like I mm -hmm. think that the public still has some education to go there, and I certainly mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. You know, when I started to learn, like, you know, we're in a culture now. It seems like you know, I'm 49, but when I was a kid, if you wanted to buy like a jacket or it was like, it seemed like it was expensive. But now it seems like. Everything's free. You go to mm -hmm. you go to H and M, and like everything is so incredibly cheap, mm -hmm. right? Well, there's a reason for that, right? Whether it's subsidies or you know Chinese factories or or what have you, you know there is a there is a very specific reason why things are so cost effective, and generally that means that there's a price being paid on the planet, or uh, you know the cost of an animal's life that's at stake, or or something else, right? And so I think it's incumbent upon on all of us, you know, myself included, to really educate ourselves about where our products come from, the processes at play that go into manufacturing and distributing them, and the, the true cost of what these items are, right? There's, a, there's actually a documentary that recently came out, and it's called True Cost, and it's about fast fashion mm -hmm. and about sustainability um, in the garment industry. That is very, very interesting when you start to, to really look into these things. Mm -hmm. and, you know, from there, it, it, it goes on and on and on. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll end it with one point, which is that to me, uh, and this is something Gene Bauer said to me that really stuck with me, veganism is an aspiration, right? None of us are gonna be able to do it perfectly. When I began, you know, I fumbled around in the dark with my diet before I found a way to make it work for myself. Uh, and it's something that I continue to do, you know, outside of the food construct and into other consumer products. It's an aspiration. It's an aspiration to live better, live more sustainably, and more compassionately. And I think when we hold ourselves to a perfectionist standard, 
um, it's not serving us, right? Because we're all human beings. We're going to make mistakes. Nobody's able to do it perfectly. You know, I have an iPhone, and I'm sure that there are you know things that go into manufacturing that product that are not ideal, and it would not be something I would be proud of if I was to witness it personally. Um, so these bargains that we enter into uh, as part of the social contract of, of being a member of this culture, you know, we're not going to be able to, to live, you know, zero waste and zero carbon emissions. But I think we can all do better, uh, and I think it's important for all of us to kind of consider that a little bit more in depth than uh, perhaps we have been historically. Thank you so much, David. Mm -hmm. That was nice, Rich. All right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> all right. So when I went vegan, oh, thanks. <laughs> so uh, when I went vegan, um, I wasn't originally like I said. I went for health reasons at first, but the thing that made me really like turn the tide and and eliminate all animal products, leather, all of this stuff, start checking all of my ingredients was I realized, you know, I don't really need any of this. Like I said before, I don't need any of this to survive. It's not making it life difficult for me. I'm living fine. I'm even healthier now for not having animal products in my life right now. So I started, and that was another thing, I started researching the stuff that I was using, and I started finding out, like, okay, I'm washing my hands. I'm going to make sure there's no animal products in the, in, the, in the hand soap. And I find out, like, oh, there's glycerin. All right, what's glycerin? Oh, that's that's animal fat. Oh God! Like, how am I cleaning my <laughs> like? How am I cleaning my hands? And I'm going to wash my hands to go eat, a, you know, animal-free meal. But there's animal fat on my hands. So, and it started making me like do more research into everything else that I was doing. And where is my leather coming from? And then I learned about the Death March, where they marched the cows to the end of the to the end of the, the country lines, and they they torture them until they in, until they're skinny, because the skinnier the cow is, the thicker their their skin's going to be. And that's where a majority of our leather comes from and so like finding out these the way that the animals what they're going through um, and putting my putting myself in their shoes and or in their hooves or their paws or whatever you want to say and it it really it's like wow like it like why am I doing this it really make opens up your eyes and and it really eliminates that disconnect which a lot of people are suffering from and that's why we wear these 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 skins, these hides, these these lifeless these uh these uh these vessels that we that we're calling bags and we're calling them clothes and shoes, but they're actually where somebody's spirit used to be and somebody some sentient being used to use that as you know that was their protection and we took it from them for our own selfish reasons and. Uh, you know, taking that time to, to think like that and, and, and take myself out of that brainwashed mind state that I was in of, you know, hey, meat's good for you. You know, the more, mil the more milk you drink, the stronger your bones are going to be. And finding out all that shit was a lie. And that, <laughs> just made, <laughs> and that made me open up my eyes and really look and say, wow, you know, um, <clears throat> to be a better person, to be the person that I'm striving to be, because I want to be a good man. That's what my goal in life is, to be the best man I could possibly be. And, and being plant-based, being a vegan man is part of that. And, uh, you know, there's no way you can do that if you continue to use, you know, lives as, some, you know, for, for your, you know, everyday life, for your purses and for your car seats. I sold, I had a Cadillac Escalade it was leather seats and they heated up. And I thought it was nice when I first got it. And then I became vegan and I was like, ugh, I'm heating up the cow skin and it's warming my butt up. And like, this isn't nice. So, but, all, but and like we had, per, we had bags and stuff and I had to sell all of that because it was like, you know, this, this is not, this is not, humans are not here to eat animals. We're not here to, to kill animals. In the Bible, I'm, I'm not Christian, but it says in the Bible, it says, you know, humans have dominion over animals, but, you know, we have dominion over our children. We're not eating them and using their, you know, and using their hides for clothes and stuff like that. So uh, and that, <laughs> that is, that, that's what made me uh, switch. It made me, I just had to take myself out of that mindset, change the way that I was looking at things. Because once I educated myself, then, you know, the way my eyes changed, it became better. My focus 
my, my vision on things just cleared up and it just changed my entire life. And that was why, it just, it's, that, it's that simple. And I feel like that's, what, that's why I love the plant-based movement, the vegan movement so much. And it's all the same, you know, we have the ethical vegans, we have the vegans mm -hmm. who went for health reasons, we have, you know, vegans for so many different mm -hmm. kinds of reasons, but we all have the same goal and the same purpose is to save the planet, save animals, you know, we just want a better place for everyone. And, you know, um, yeah, I think I kind of went off, but that's just the whole point. It was like, <laughs> thank you. I just want to say we endorse everything said on this panel. <laughs> Michelle. That was, that was nice, David. <laughs> so I'm sitting here thinking it's a little ironic that I uh, am the one physician on this panel who uh, went vegan for not health reasons. Um, and I can definitely relate to what you were saying, Dom's, about being, being little and eating a piece of chicken and looking at it and thinking, this, is, this just doesn't sit with me. This is, this is kind of weird. And I think I never really, I guess I never really unlearned um, the difference between what was on my plate and what was an animal. So for me, it was one and the same. And it, I had a very hard time uh, eating something that I recognized as an animal rather than as something lifeless on the plate. Uh, and I spoke earlier about, um, you know, it took 20 plus years after that for me to actually make the connection with eggs and dairy. And once I did, as, as you were saying earlier, and you realize that um, there's as much suffering and cruelty there, uh, if not more, uh, than what goes on in some of the other foods that we eat that uh, that are meat, um, I, I really uh, felt, I just, I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't possibly participate in that. So, you know, for me, it was a very quick transition because, uh, to becoming vegan and, and because of the animals, because I just felt like I can't, I just can't do this. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, it's not a quick transition. It's a huge life change. It's, it's, I see this all the time because I talk to people in my practice a lot about how to incorporate more plant foods into their diet and even move towards being fully plant-based. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's hard for people to make a big change sometimes. Um, but I, I think one of, the, one of the key things that I've realized is that you know, people who become uh, vegan or plant-based for health reasons um, often feel a, a tremendous, uh, they feel benefits very quickly and, and uh, they come off medications, they avoid procedures and surgeries and I see that in my practice all the time and it's so rewarding. Uh, but I think for some people to stay on the path of being plant-based or vegan, it's really quite helpful to, under, to have a deeper understanding of the, of the implications and have a really a broader understanding. And so I think that for me, you know, people say, oh, well, how could you, you know, how could you, don't you crave cheese pizza or, you know, for me, having an understanding of where my food comes from has made it for me quite pretty straightforward to not participate in that. And when I talk to my patients about following an eating pattern that's based in whole plant foods and is really healthy, you get kind of the best of all worlds. You get the health aspects, you get environmental aspects, and of course, certainly you get um, ethical benefits as well. So that's sort of how I see my intersection with, with animals. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think uh, Michelle is right. I think it's really important for people to make that connection from when it comes to the, uh, the ethical side of things. And if I had my way, everyone would have to watch a documentary such as Earthlings mm -hmm. to see exactly oh, what your money is doing yeah. to these, these animals out here. Um, it's, just, it's just not right. And what Rich is saying, listen, it's not a perfect lifestyle, but it's definitely a lifestyle that costs the least amount of harm. Simple as that. I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, and why wouldn't you want to live that way? Like, why would you want to continue to contribute to um, the killing of billions and billions of animals annually? It just doesn't make any logical sense to me. And it also doesn't make any logical sense to me. I feel like we're just not by design to 
uh, should be out here killing animals. I see people out saying, well, the hunters and gatherers, and that's bullshit, you know? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It, it's so much oh, bullshit. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and the only reason I'm getting a little bit more loose because, I mean, David kicked it off. I feel like I'm on HBO now, so I'm going to kind of... <laughs> I'm going to kind of not have a little bit of filter going on here, but... <laughs> and let's just be real. Good job, good job. Good job. <laughs> but in all seriousness, yeah, I mean, I just feel like humans, we are not designed to eat meat. We, we can't go out here to go catch a damn animal if we needed to. And if we could, we couldn't even break the skin, our, our jaw bone and crack. You know, it's just, it's just foolishness. It, it doesn't make any logical sense to me. Uh, and, yeah, fashion is a big thing. It's, it's a huge aha moment when you first get into this lifestyle, it was things that I didn't even realize. Like I said, when I was a vegetarian, I was still rocking a, a pea coat made of wool, and I didn't realize the amount of harm that was being done to these animals out here just to put some piece of fabric on my back. And I'm all about, you know, listen, I'm, I, I, I always shop ethical all the time, but I'm also about really supporting small businesses that don't have that product line in their catalog. And I encourage you all to really support those companies that don't have leather over here, but have some recycled plastic shirts over here. It's still going into one um, um, uh, mass company, one uh, parent company that's actually contributing and, and really pulling the trigger to produce that, um, that garment that's causing the harm to those animals. So keep that in mind when you shop, and definitely always shop with those preferably all vegan-owned companies. I know they're expensive out there, but your dollar really supports those guys, and it really can produce more product out here for more people uh, to uh, shop consciously, so. Thank you so much. So, Dominic, how do you really feel? <laughs> yeah. Just to clarify, so, um, I had four questions. I'm not asking four questions. I'm going to ask a quick second question, and then we're going to do Q&A. Um, so I'm not a big social media person. They didn't really teach us that in graduate school. In fact, I was taught Instagram through Dominic, uh, and I'm really bad at it. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm so sorry. Interrupt. Yeah, you can interrupt me. That's okay. okay. My students do all the time. <laughs> we're, looking at, <laughs> we're looking at this next question that you were supposed to answer, and I think we would much rather you ask that one. No. The third one. The third one, the big one. I will ask that. <laughs> they yeah. have to hear it. Yeah, I think, that one, I think that's a good one. This is uh, an awesome uh, teaching uh, moment. It's <laughs> 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 great. Yeah. All right. Hang on. Go, David. So how do you? <laughs> All right, Rich, Rich you can, you can uh, shoot it off, bro. Yeah, well, I'm going to wanna... start with Rich then and go down this way. All right, do you want to ask the question? Yes, I'm going to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> It won't be a secret. It's yeah. not a secret question. <laughs> I wanted, in the interest of time, to, get, to give everyone, but I really wanted somebody else to ask this question, and I have 20 students who are captive here, and they were all told to ask this if we didn't address it, but we're going to go for it. So how do you see your veganism interacting with stereotypes of masculinity and femininity and with boundaries of race and gender? Very, very important. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, my students are in a class called Being Vegan, the Literature of Environmental Justice, and I said, if nobody asks that question, you all have to get up. You're asking that question. So, you just saved them the embarrassment of that. Um, this is a really important question because veganism is often seen as elitist, top-down, whitewashed, um, effeminate, extreme lifestyle, limiting the, uh, you know, superlatives could go on as well. Um, and so we really wanted to know how does it speak to issues of uh, race, class, and um, stereotypes of masculinity and femininity? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> You're welcome, Rich. <laughs> I could talk for hours and hours about this, so I'm gonna have to limit it a little bit, but I, I think maybe I'll focus, <laughs> I'll focus on the, the, the masculinity aspect of it, because I think this is really important. Um, you know, we're in a culture right now where, for whatever reason, we've decided that it's super macho and masculine to, you know, barbecue, uh, you know, barbecue your steak in the backyard or go deer hunting or, you know, whatever it is, this idea of dominion over animals in the, in the sort of domineering definition of that word is associated with what it means to be a man. And this is a very uh, pernicious paradigm that uh, I take 
slight issue with, and I think that we should all work to overcome because it's fucking bullshit. <laughs> Pardon me. No filters. Part of the reason why I endorse everything. Part of the reason why the paleo diet is so popular is that it speaks to this innate need that I think a lot of men share who are feeling disenfranchised. They're stuck in jobs they don't like. They don't feel like they're fully expressed in their masculinity as men. And when a diet comes along and says, you can be a hunter-gatherer, and these are the foods that you eat, and you can connect with your primal nature, that's an easy sell. And that is marketing 101. And wow. that's why, in large part, it's become a very popular diet. And on the other end of the spectrum, to be able to you know, convince a guy that uh, he can still feel empowered as a man without partaking in these pastimes that we have decided are part and parcel of what it means to be a man is a much more difficult sell. But the truth of the matter is that the greatest leaders that this planet has ever seen have been able to balance great power with great compassion. There is nothing more sexy and more masculine than a man who is standing in his power and knows how to exercise that compassion. And when we stand from a place of power in terms of our relationship to animals, and we can say, you know what, we don't need that. We're a better off world by not slaughtering these animals for our food. And as you know, a panel of people up here who are all shining examples of people who are living their lives happily and healthily without these animals, the idea that we would still partake in that does not make sense to me does not make sense to me. I think it is actually the much more masculine choice to remove animal products from your diet and from your life. That is an act of great compassion. It's an act of strength. It's an act of discipline. And I, and I think it speaks deeply to character. Thank you. We're not skipping the applause on that one. <laughs> That was good, Rich. Just <laughs> <laughs> trying to live up to your speech, buddy. Oh, man. No. We're all here in the same fight. All right. So uh, I'm going to touch briefly on the masculinity part as well, and I'm going to just get right to the point. Uh, erectile dysfunction <laughs> is, is a real thing, and it is, really stems from the food that we eat, uh, men. Um, it's OK. Cholesterol, okay, so the penis is like, <laughs> it, fills up, it fills up with yeah. blood. So if your arteries are clogged from cholesterol oh or the, food, the food that you're eating, the cholesterol, only place you can find cholesterol is in meat and dairy products. So if your artery is going to your tool or your member or whatever you want to use to describe it, it's not, blood is not flowing to your tool or your member, and that's due to the food that you're eating. So one, that's why food, I mean, why being vegan is masculine, because, I mean, your tool's gonna work. And then, <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's, that's, and I think that's a really strong argument as to why you, all men should be plant-based. And then, uh, So, um, yeah, you got all these buff guys walking around here looking all strong and whatnot, but, you know, hey. They, 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 <laughs> no, uh, okay, and then, so I'm gonna move on. And then, uh, also, too, also, you know, how are you supposed to be, okay, so when you think of a man, you think of masculinity, you think of, you know, uh, the man of the family, you think of a protector, someone who's strong, someone who can provide um, an, an example, someone you can look up to. But how can you be any of that if you're sick, if you're overweight, you can hardly walk around. You know, you can't see your feet because your belly's too big. I mean, these things, you can't be a man like that. What kind of example is that? You're not an example of health. If, you want, if your kids look up to you, you want them to see a strong, healthy man, someone who knows what they're supposed to be eating, you know, and so you can pass that information on to your children so they can be strong, healthy men and women growing up in life, you know? So, uh, I mean, I think it's really, I think it's just totally, just crazy for someone to be, I'm a man, I'm a man, I eat meat, I eat steak, or you're just ignorant and you're uninformed and you don't know anything. So, <laughs> um, then also um, it says uh, veganism is often seen as like elitist, top down, white privilege, and you know, and 
Uh, <laughs> it kind of is, because <laughs> <laughs> because you think because if just based off of how the the world set up with we have food deserts and it's hard to get plant based uh, plant based foods into like inner city areas. You know, people or families are grocery shopping in like 7-Eleven and liquor stores and corner store markets and stuff. You can't get healthy foods like that. And so, yeah, it's gonna be elitist and, you know, and let's face it, the way the world is like right now, it's just not set up for people to, uh, in the inner city areas and all that stuff. So it is elitist, but what we can do is we can help to educate people on how to, we can bring like farmer's markets into the inner city areas because farmer market is as cheap as it gets. That's where I get all of my groceries from. It, it just, it, it is, I agree that it is that. And we just have to make a change and how we can do that is we can just help by educating everyone. Education is the key to, 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 healing everyone because when people learn how to eat properly, when people learn how uh, meat and dairy affect their bodies, and then they'll, then they'll start to make that change. And so that's what I do. I educate, I try to educate everyone through my story, through my journey, and what I've learned. And I go into inner city areas and educate to try to turn the tide. So uh, yeah. Thank you, David. So you stole my line because I was going to explain erectile dysfunction <laughs> at the molecular level, but I like how you did it better. Um, so yeah, no, but you're, you're, he's exactly right. So there's actually, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Dr. Terry Mason, who's a urologist uh, out in Chicago. He's uh, an amazing speaker, and he always talks about, you know, the best way to get men to go vegan is by talking about the penis. And you heard it here. So. This panel has taken a turn that is unexpected. <laughs> and I have just gotten a number of phone calls from a New York City area code. So <laughs> I'm just hoping I still have my job tomorrow. But go on, Michelle. We're listening. <laughs> but it, it's, it's true. You know, I find it really interesting, um, the, the whole the percept perception around masculinity and meat uh, when, first of all, let's just lay it out straight. Where are people getting most of the estrogen or the female hormones in their diet, yeah. they're getting it from animal products. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna talk about masculinity, that's something to think about. Um, but at, a, at an even more profound level, just as David was saying, most of, these, most of the animal products that we're eating, particularly the processed meats and the red meats, uh, have a lot to do with our health problems. It's, it's, it's very hard to argue against that. We have so much scientific evidence to support that at this point. Um, so diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, narrowing of the arteries, erectile dysfunction, these are direct consequences of our food choices. So when it comes to masculinity, uh, that's something that uh, really needs to be emphasized. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the concept of veganism or plant-based diets as being elitist. So I work as I said before, at Bellevue Hospital, which is the country's oldest public hospital. And it's a, it's a safety net facility where many of my patients are on public assistance. Um, I take care of a wide range of patients, but I wanna say that my personal experience has been that people are eager to hear this information no matter what walk of life they're coming from. They want to hear from their doctors, in my experience, about how they can use food to heal themselves and not be on more pills and not get more procedures and surgeries. And when a doctor or a healthcare professional sits down with them and helps them understand how to do that, it's very effective. And I have patients who've transformed their lives by doing this, and they also live in areas that could be considered food deserts. And they just need some support, and as you said, the education. Uh, when you look around the world, many, many cultures around the world have been plant-based for a very, very long time, and it's people's, uh, a, lot of, a lot of my patients also, their traditional diets are based in plants. And so just talking to people about, you know, where, what is the, what's indigenous, what did, what did your grandparents grow up eating where you're from, um, and what's accessible to you, uh, it can, can really work. Um, and, and I think that, you know, 
we have a lot of work to do in terms of being able to spread healthy food options to a lot of communities in this country, but I've definitely seen it work, and, uh, and people are very grateful for the information. Thank you so much, Michelle. I, I think one of the biggest problems why people feel like it might be some type of elitist lifestyle because um, you know, marketers are becoming more irresponsible and, and even sometimes bloggers post these fancy pictures and you see these fancy dinners at Crossroads or Candle 79. So yeah, that's going to cost you about $100 you know, <laughs> if you want to take, take someone there and stuff like that. But th th listen, the diet is it's inexpensive. It's not expensive as you think it is. You know, it, it, is, it all depends on how creative you want to be in the kitchen. Um, you know, fruit doesn't cost that much. Food deserts are very real in the different communities throughout America, that's for sure. Uh, but it, it, it also needs to start with ed education, though, and let people know that you can still have that similar lifestyle you had before. You can still watch football, have tofu hot dogs, grill hamburgers, vegan hamburgers, per se, and have beer and hang out with the fellas, and you're not taking away, you're not looking like some, some you know, weak individual or some type of weak in a, in a guy. <laughs> I really want to say another name, but yeah. Thank uh, you, you know, so much uh, for not saying I want her to keep her job. <laughs> uh, I care about her and her job, you know, so I'm not going to say that. Uh, but yeah, you know, I just think it's, it's, it's BS. And listen, uh, we as men have to be more responsible. We have to take care of this planet, take care of our families, take care of ourselves. Um, and we have to, this, this is the best lifestyle, I promise you. It, it really is. It costs the least amount of harm. And I really encourage you to really look into it. Thank you so much, Dominic. So, <laughs> I think one thing all four of you are pointing to is that there's a systemic um, and structural cloaking of truth and that the four of you have really looked into that and I um, applaud you because it's really hard to look at um, the ways in which uh, sort of unseemly things are being kept from the public because there's a lot of money behind that. So I'm still gonna ask my fourth question <laughs> really quickly. Um, David, you wouldn't know this, but I, so I ventured onto Instagram because of Dominic. I'm really bad at it. Uh, I even let him like post something for me at one point because I just said, you take over. I don't understand how to use this. So I responded to some comment that uh, David, uh, you had posted about um, Jack Norris, the uh, vegan um, outreach president. And he had said, uh, go vegan if you can, except for cheese. If that's all you can do, then go vegan except for cheese. And you got a lot of responses, hundreds of them. And some of them were like, you're a fake, you're a fraud. We haven't had this conversation, so he's hearing this for the first time. And I defended you. I thought you might need that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And then these trolls came after me. <laughs> <laughs> True story. And we're like, I quote, if you had a brain, maybe you would educate yourself. Get smarter. Look into David. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I got personal messages about this, and I thought, okay, this is crazy. I don't understand how they're so active on social media. So my question is, um, how do you use, because all four of you have really mobilized social media in effective, smart, savvy, positive ways, you know, despite, I think, some of the negative ways in which it can be um, used. So I'm going to start with Dominic this time. Uh, Tell me a little bit about social media and how it's helped you. And we're going to go quickly, and then it's <clears throat> Q&A. Um, yeah, so when I came on social media a couple of years ago, I was the total opposite of what people assume a vegan guy should look like, which is the cliche thought of uh, skinny pal, uh, middle-aged white American. Um, uh, <laughs> far from it. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I think that's what really hit home for a lot of people. They seen, here's this guy that's kind of big in size. Um, you know, he's, he's a, um, not, he's not uh, white, he's, he's big, he's, he's running, running, I'm doing marathons, I'm doing triathlons, uh, I'm still keeping my size on, uh, and more importantly, I'm talking about what's really happening to these animals. I, I think that's what really hit home for a lot of people, because you had a lot of vegan guys out there, and men and women, uh, vegan athletes, that was just uh, not really talking about the ethical part, and I was the ones like, I was like, F it, you know, this is, that's why I became vegan. I didn't go vegan to show you what my arms look like or what my abs look like. I came vegan to really educate you about what's really happening in the system, uh, the factory farm system and stuff like that. So uh, social media, it, listen, some people 
don't like it. I think it's a great tool to really communicate to people, to really educate people. It's become a problem for a lot of companies. Um, and I think that's a, a beautiful thing because you can really, uh, we, we live in a day and age about where, where transparency is very, very important. Um, and that's what social media should be about. It really should be about really educating people and, and showing the honest truth about what's really happening in some of these industries. Um, so Instagram is something that's, it, for me, I, I don't live on, I'm not a blog, I don't live online. I, I you know, I'm a healthcare professional, uh, uh, professional. I, don't, I don't work clinical. Uh, I do work in healthcare though. Uh, most of you guys know that I'm an executive in healthcare. I do business development. I manage different markets. Uh, so I don't have time to sit online, but I do post things that are important to me. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just my thought. So when you guys see a post by Dom's, um, that's just my thought at the time. And I post as much as I can. And, and, and sometimes it hits home, and it, it grew organically from there. So that's pretty much how I became who I am today, um, just posting my thoughts. And I, I, I guess that's a testament to show that people just like the real, raw truth. People don't like the fake stuff. Um, again, I'm not in my underwear showing my abs, and, and that's, that's just not what I'm about. I'm really about really hitting home and really educating people with what I can uh, when it comes to this industry. Thank you, Michelle, if you would. Yeah, I mean, my, my response to this question is going to be pretty brief because I'm not even on Facebook. <laughs> never, never joined Facebook. Um, I mean, I, I, I enjoy Twitter and Instagram, and I have to uh, echo what Dom's is saying about the power of social media. The first time I tweeted Delta and got a response, I was, it was like a rush, you know. Thank you for the vegan sandwich on the flight. Um, or Amtrak, you know, thank you for another, having another plant-based option on the Northeast Corridor. Um, it's, it's great, and, and I think my, my challenge with social media personally is to, um, to find some balance with it, because it can be pretty addictive. Yeah. Thank you, um, David, go ahead. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Uh, I do have a love-hate relationship with social media. It, it's too much time, like you said, mm -hmm. but, but it's necessary. Um, I use it to, like, uh, like Dom, I uh, just use it to voice my opinion and to just use it as a platform to reach out to people, let them know that, you know, you don't have to eat meat to get big. And it's been great. I get so much love from it, and um, I continue to use it as a, as a place to, you know, share what I learned throughout my journey and, and share my journey with people. So that's why I use it. And I think it's great because it, uh, you know, it, it's just – it puts everybody on the same wavelength. If somebody wants to go find some information about something, you can just, you know, hashtag look for this or something, and you'll find it. You'll find someone doing which, what it is that you want to do. And I love it. I mean, it's, it's the best thing. So, go ahead, man. I know. He deserves better. <laughs> yeah, this idea that, that there's media and then there's social media, I think is a fallacy. I think social media <laughs> is media. You know, it, social media is what it is right now. It is, it is everything. It is how we communicate. And I don't think that we quite, uh, I think we've quite really fully appreciated the extent to which, uh, you know, it, it, it has changed our lives and holds the potential to continually change our lives and, and, you know, forge culture moving forward because it essentially removes the gatekeeper in between the individual and an audience. And that's an incredibly powerful shift in our fulcrum that our, you know, the history of mankind has never before experienced. The fact that we all carry around in our pocket this device that allows us to tap into an unlimited, you know, source of information uh, and answer every question we could possibly, you know, ask ourselves is, is just an unbelievable thing. And I think with that, uh, it carries a certain level of responsibility, right? And, and in terms of being an, uh, you know, a social media person and, uh, and, and, a, and an advocate, you know, a vegan advocate, uh, I have to spend a lot of time thinking about you know, what that means and what I want to express. And mm -hmm. so whether it's an Instagram post, a blog post, you know, a book, a documentary, a YouTube video, or a podcast, these are all different, just different forms of, of media using different distribution platforms. But the message, you know, is the same. It's like, what is the information that you're communicating? Why are you communicating it? And what is your, you know, what is your intention and what are you trying to accomplish? And, you know, I suppose the largest um, kind of use of social media that I use is, is the podcast that I have that I started three years ago. And, 
you know, it started off as just a tiny little thing and it's grown into this thing that has a global audience and mm -hmm. it's, I'm very proud of what it's become. Um, and like I said, it, 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 it instills me with a sense of responsibility though because I know that it is touching people in a, in a significant way. And I know that because I get emails from people all over the world. And the fact that I'm able to do that, I'm just a guy, right? Is just, it's an incredible, Thing. You know, the fact that we have these tools that allow us to, you know, create new trajectories for our lives and not be kind of wed to traditional career paths, I think is incredibly, uh, incredibly empowering. And I think in the context of the vegan movement, um, the fact that we have all these different voices out there using their own specific personalities and, and means of communication to convey this message. I think is is really like a powerful thing. You know, the kind of person that follows me might be somebody different than the person mm -hmm. that's gonna follow Dominic or, or Michelle or David. Mm -hmm. And all of those voices are valid and they're all important. And I think together, that's how we shift culture. Thank you so much. So someone earlier said, good luck on your arm candy panel. <laughs> And I said, oh, great, what? And I uh, hadn't really put it together. Um, I hope you've shown, I, I think they've shown that there are more brains, actually, than um, brawn. Um, really, really amazing intelligence up here. And one thing, one concern that Nicola and I had was that each person up here could be their own panel for two hours, um, certainly, on, on their own. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to open up the Q&A, and I would just ask that you be succinct and ask a question. And if it's pointed, tell us to whom the question is pointed. There are two mics mid-aisle. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's great to see six different vegans. Um, I'll repeat so, the question if you can't up. hear it. So um, just like institutional racism is a real thing, there, are, there is this, institu this food institution, which is poisoning people and blatantly lying to people. And food deserts are a real thing, and we're very privileged to be in NYU and in this area surrounded by vegan restaurants. But if you go to Atlanta, you go uptown, people literally, like you said, shop at convenience stores. So how do you take down this, this massive industry or this like institution that is systemic, like you said, that is blatantly lying to people in the, med in the medicine industry where people are going to doctors and they're being told to eat more meat, more dairy, more fish, whatever it may be. How do you, how do you take that? How do you take on that system? How do you? How do That's you a it? really big question. How yeah. do you take down the food system? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll get back no. to you. <laughs> Good. No, 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 we're gonna take the second question. Go ahead. Hi, I just want to say uh, thank you all for being here and for all you're doing in the vegan movement. I think my question is directed most uh, mainly to Rich, um, my colleague who's also my only vegan colleague at work, he had a question, so it's coming from him. He wanted to know about a recent podcast you did, I think with Ray Conrice, who I believe he said, believes that most people over-exercise and overeat. so I just wanted to know what are your thoughts on, on that. Do you think exercise or food is really the key to longevity, or is it both? Mm -hmm. Exercise or food, that's the question? Like, yes, yeah, which one? Okay. Yeah, which one Great. for longevity? Thank you so much. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm looking to switch to a more um, raw vegan diet, and I just wanted to know how that's changed or elevated your sweat life grind. And is that directed at somebody in particular? Uh, Dominic. Dominic, great. Okay, so the first question is institutional um, issues or systemic issues of food security, food deserts. I think maybe Michelle should answer, how do you take down the food and health industries? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a plan in my back pocket. <laughs> we get get right on that. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's obviously a huge issue. It's not just it's not just the medical community. It's the you know it's it's the lobbying. It's politics. Uh, it's it, everything is intertwined in that. And um, I, I do think it's a really important start to uh, educate. Uh, healthcare professionals about what the evidence really does show about what we should be eating and that message can then spread um, but by the same token I would say that as the public gets more informed on their own through platforms on social media and other as information is more readily available they're actually going to doctors and they're already more aware than the doctor is so it does kind of go both ways and um, again to the 
point about food access, of course this is a big issue, uh, but I will say again in my experience and my practice, I've been able to help people um, eat a plant-based diet on very, very, very little money. Uh, New York City, actually, the farmer's markets accept food stamps. Um, there's a lot of ways around this and it just takes a little bit of creativity, but um, again, what people uh, put into their body is probably the most important uh, thing for long-term health. That's been shown in a lot of studies, so I think it's an incredibly important thing to emphasize. And what you, what you spend on food, you can save on pills. Great. Thank you, Michelle, so much. Now, Rich, the question for you, exercise or food? Which is the key to a vibrant life? If you had to choose one. I think this is a question for Michelle. <laughs> I could have taken the other you. one. Great Every you. question is going to be for Michelle. But I think I, it, the question was in response to a podcast that I did with a scientist named Ray Cronice, who is a plant-based advocate, and he's a, he's sort of a uh, a guy who's been doing a lot of experiments and self-experimentation across a wide spectrum of diet and lifestyle protocols, everything from cold therapy and thermoregulation and the, the impact that has on weight loss. Uh, to you know, eating a plant-based diet, to intermittent fasting. This guy is like fasted. I think he fasted for like 20. I can't remember how many. Like a lot of days, you know, without like eating anything, just drinking water and and taking all his blood markers and experimenting with this. And his one of the things that he mentioned, and this is what the question kind of germinated from, was that we conflate uh, exercise with diet when we're looking at whether it's losing weight or just getting healthier. And I think that. The consensus, uh, and Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the most profound thing that you can do for your health is to first, you know, dial up your plate, like figure out your diet. That's much more important than exercise. You cannot exercise your way out of an unhealthy diet. Maybe when you're 20 years old, you can look super fit. That doesn't necessarily mean that on the inside you're healthy. You know, we start building up these plaques. Heart disease is America's number one killer. One out of every three people in America is gonna die of heart disease, right? By 2030, 50% of Americans are gonna be diabetic or pre-diabetic. Uh, you know, the healthcare statistics are just incredibly just depressing when you look at it and when you realize that these chronic lifestyle illnesses that we're suffering from are unnecessary and can be resolved, prevented, sometimes reversed through simple dietary shifts that's an unbelievable thing to start to learn about, right? Exercise is certainly important. It's certainly, you know, mm -hmm. it's important in all of our mm -hmm. lives sitting up here, and, and it's benefited me tremendously. But <clears throat> I think first you've got to focus on, on your diet. That's much more important to master, and then you can talk about exercise. Great. Thank you. I hope your colleague appreciates that answer. Raw veganism, Dominic. Yeah, so my diet is primarily raw, um, and for me, you know, it really helps with my training. I'm able to train about three to four times a day. Keep in mind, I work anywhere between 50 to 60 hours a week, including weekends. And this is a true story. And I train about two to three times a day. Um, in the mornings, um, I train during my lunch hour. I kind of fuel throughout the day. Uh, you guys probably see me post pictures of my mason jars every hour. I cock back about 12 to 24 ounces of juiced um, uh, fruits or smoothies, uh, fruit smoothies. Um, and yeah, so. I, I think it's really important to really, uh, vegan, the vegan diet is really great, but it's also important to know, you know what you're putting in your body. It's very important for you to really to adopt um, primarily whole-based foods as far as plant-based foods. Um, those tofu sandwiches are great, but <laughs> uh, I, I definitely prefer raw fruit over any processed vegan food any day. And because of that, that's why I don't need to take supplements. I don't need to take protein powder. You don't need none of that stuff. It's nothing but synthetics, and it's harmful to your body. So uh, definitely look into that. It helps me, and I'm sure it will help you. Thank you so much. So thank you, all three of you. So Rich is signing books afterwards. Uh, Dominic uh, will be out there with his crazies and weirdos line uh, also. We are short on time. I'm gonna take three questions from this mic, three questions from the next, just quick fire. Ask the question, and we're happy we will answer them. So please go ahead. Thank you for being here. For all the vegetarians in the room who are thinking about going all the way, the non-vegans who are dragged by their vegan friends, <laughs> and the vegans who wanna be better advocates, I'll ask for concrete examples. Your favorite protein-rich food, your favorite clothing company or clothing article, or and a video to recommend. 
I'll go first. I know you're closing. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody think I'm crazy, but listen, watermelon. Uh, it, it's a super fruit. It, it's the, I knew he was going to say it's that. It's so good. Anywhere between the month of April all the way to October, you can catch me. I, I literally eat about one to two whole watermelons a day. It's about 18 to 24 grams of protein in that watermelon, and it helps with my training. Seriously, I, I'm primary. Instead of me saying I'm primary in water, I'm primary based. Yeah, watermelon based. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Uh, favorite line of clothes? Crazies and weirdos. In all, <laughs> was uh, in all seriousness, we're, we're scaling. Uh, thanks to the help of you guys, I can't thank you so much, but uh, one or two years from now, you will see us be basically the vegan version of The Gap, where we're your one-stop shop. You can get shoes from us, coats, you name it. Uh, we'll have a store here in New York launching pretty soon. And yeah, that's, that's my favorite line. Um, so we weren't supposed to answer yet. We were going to take two more. Okay. But that Sorry. was good, though. We, we're excited. Okay. So I'm going to guess that out of the 450 yeah. people here today, uh, not all of them walking in were vegan. And so I myself work for an animal protection group that advocates Meatless Monday, but I'm really intrigued as to what you all think would be an appropriate, reasonable next step for someone who came in, maybe eats meat seven days a week. Uh, what advice would you have for them? All right. Thank you so much. And Molly, is that you? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, so I know like becoming a vegan is, as you all mentioned, a deviation from what you grew up with. So I'm wondering sort of what impact that has had on the people around you, such as your families and loved ones. I know, David, you mentioned your family owns a barbecue restaurant. Sort of what has happened, uh, what the fallout was or the impact you've had on them? That's a good thank, question. Thank you so much. We're going to go to the other mic now. Next three questions. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, DJ Khaled is on a 22 Vegan Day Challenge. Oh, uh, so some general thoughts on uh, his initiative. And also, is 22 days enough to experience a healthy lifestyle change? Is that a question? Yeah. yeah, no, okay. yeah, I, I, yeah. Are, you, are we answering that question right now? Right? I think she's writing it down. Writing I'm writing it down. Can you ask that question is again? Is 22 I, days enough to experience a lifestyle change? Oh, is 22 change? days enough? Oh, mm -hmm. I see. I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll let them answer. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, for a new generation of vegans raising vegan athletes, your advice for parents raising vegan athletes, especially in the teenage years, and sports where size does matter. Oh, OK. All right. Thank you so much. Next. Hi, everyone. My name is Dave. I'm actually a second year medical student at NYU. And the frustration I have is that most of my classmates are not vegan. And these are supposedly some of the smartest people, hopefully most compassionate people. And my question is related to how people are like addicted to meat, to dairy, to <laughs> cheese, to eggs. I'm wondering like this addiction, we, we learn about pre-contemplation, contemplation, then preparation, and actually making a change. Everyone in my medical school, and I think it's a reflection of our country too, is in pre-contemplation and not even thinking about wanting to change. And I'm wondering how, within our own spheres of influence, how we can get people to start from pre-contemplation to contemplation, to start being more compassionate, not just to ourselves, but also to the world around us. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really important question. So there are three questions that are intimately connected. One is, how do you speak to non-vegans about going vegan, which speaks to your question, right? Like, how do you get them over that precipice of, of thinking about the change, as our uh, one, as Uli said, he's headed in that direction. So there's a lot of people that are headed in that direction. Not to shame him too much publicly. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, what do you uh, recommend, um, or, or what type of impact has it had on loved ones? We just had Kip, Kip and Keegan out here from Cowspiracy, and uh, it was hilarious. I went to dinner with them, and uh, Keegan uh, <laughs> said oh, I'm a, a total jerk to my family. He said, I went vegan and I just am a tyrant. He's like, I call them. I, <laughs> he's just like, like um, he sounded almost, uh, well, very angry, but um, uh, homicidal <laughs> towards people who were not vegan. It was very funny. So that was his approach towards his loved ones. Not everyone takes that. <laughs> so the question for you guys, I guess, is how do you speak to people who are not vegan? What would you recommend in terms of films or products? Um, and what has the impact been on loved ones? Who would like to answer that? Yeah. I'll, I'll take that Go. one. Yeah. Uh, first of all, like my friends and my family don't listen to me. <laughs> so I'm at a loss when it comes to that. It's funny, you know, they just, they don't care what I have to say. Um, but I'm a firm believer in 
meeting people where they're at. And that's just my personal approach to advocacy. Uh, I think change, personal change has to be self-generated. And that change comes from an inherent uh, uh, willingness, right? And you cannot compel somebody who's not willing to become willing. They have to become willing on their own. So when I say I try to meet people where they're at, I try to understand what they're interested in and I can speak to them through that lens, right? So if somebody really isn't in a place where they're gonna watch Earthlings or you know, they, don't, they just don't wanna hear about you know, what happens to sheep when they get sheared, uh, I'm probably not gonna talk about it with that person because they're not gonna be able to hear it and the wall's gonna come up and actually I'm, I'm moving away from my goal, which is to get them to move forward, right? So I try to make non-threatening suggestions to people that are kind of in that place, like, hey, maybe, you know, why don't you, you know, rethink, you know, instead of making meat the focus of your plate, maybe make it a side dish and see if that makes any difference, you know. But I don't try to tell people what they should do or shouldn't do. I don't take other people's inventory. I try to lead by example, and I try to make myself available when they're ready and they're willing and they come to me. Like, it's always more effective when somebody approaches you. And I think, um, you know, something that has not been said tonight that I think is important to point out because this is a vegan athletes panel is, is how important the athletes are. And the athletes are important in this movement because it's not about what comes out of their mouth. It's not about what happens at a panel and, and what's, what they're saying, it's what they do. It's like how David performs on the field is going to speak much more loudly about the vegan movement and its efficacy in the context of performance and what that means about being a man and masculinity that, than anything that he can say, right? So that's why I think, like I'm a skinny runner guy, like I'm very non-threatening, but when you see, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, one of the Diaz brothers take out Conor McGregor in, in a UFC fight when the world is watching, yeah. and you understand that, you know, I don't know if he's entirely vegan, but the guy basically eats like a vegan diet, right? Like that's, that, that is a, um, a moment in time that can catalyze a million conversations around the planet about this lifestyle. And so that's where I think the athletes become very important spokespeople in carrying this message. Thank you so much. So I wanna ask the question about vegan uh, parenting. Do any of the four of you wanna to speak to that? Um, how do you parent as a vegan, uh, and how do you parent specifically, or think about um, if your children play sports where size does matter, how would you speak to them? I know you don't all have children, but uh, these are really important questions because often vegans get asked, like, well, what would you do if you had a child? How would you raise that child? So it's a really common uh, question. Who would like, Michelle, I feel. <laughs> Like, you want to answer that. You must know that I'm a very devoted aunt. Yes, to, I do know that, to actually. To two uh, nephews and two nieces who are all being raised vegan. And um, yeah, you can actually applaud my mom and my, uh, one of my two sisters who are here in the front row so for that. Um, yeah, it's pretty awesome to be part of an all-vegan family. Um, and I've definitely seen the benefits firsthand in terms of um, how my nieces and nephews have been raised in their consciousness around food and just their vitality and um, a household of abundance and where food is really certainly celebrated and um, there's not deprivation and there's not sacrifice and uh, it's just food tastes really good um, at every, you know, in Thanksgiving and, and so forth. What's that? Broccoli. broccoli. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sums it up. Broccoli. Um, they love broccoli. Um, broccoli and watermelon. Yeah. And watermelon. <laughs> yeah. What, what kid doesn't love watermelon? Yeah. So, um, so I think, you know, I can't, I don't have kids myself, so I can't speak to the, you know, personally to the challenges, but I know that, I know in my family, it's, it's, um, you know, it's worked out very well. They're very healthy and play sports. My nephews are amazing basketball and baseball players. And um, so, uh, so I don't know if anyone else wants to. No, I want to, to ask Dominic or David, 22 days. Is that good? I mean, uh, it's better well, than. You're going to get a little bit of something. You'll feel better. You know, you'll probably lose a little bit of weight and everything like that. But you, I didn't really start feeling like the real benefits as far as like physically, like my tendonitis and everything going away to like the next week or like week four. 
that's when I really started feeling the benefits. Like my joints started feeling better. Um, you know, I was, you know, everything just was working better. I was using the restroom like I was supposed to, all of that stuff. All of, it, it's a little bit personal, but that's real life. Like some people are not, you know, using the restroom like they should be. So, uh, but, <laughs> hey. Fiber. People aren't taking shits like they should be. Like, they're not doing it. <laughs> it's, it's like people don't use the restroom for like three oh, days, yeah. and they're, they're like, "Oh, I'm, I'm healthy." You know, I've gone to the doctor. You know, you need to get that out of you, bro. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah, but so 22 days is not enough. If it's been in there for 20 22, I think 20, yeah, yeah, back to the original question. But yeah. 22 days is, is <laughs> 22 days is good, and you'll feel some benefits from that. But really, like, it's more of the long term. The longer you stick with it, the more benefits you'll feel from it. Uh, a lot of people, like, start getting off of their diabetic, off of medication and stuff, like, around, like, a few months. So that's when you really start to feel the benefits. So. Thank you so much. I would like to take the next four questions. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Hi, so my question is directed mostly towards Rich, but um, obviously anybody can answer it. Uh, what would you do if you were uh, made Surgeon General tomorrow? What would be your plan of action? Wow. That's right back at you. Right back at you. Yes, starting it off. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Second question. Sorry. My question for you is um, the doctor lady. <laughs> I don't know. Who that, is that is her? There, <laughs> sorry, is there a recommended um, type of food you should eat as a vegan based on your heritage? I've got a mother and father-in-law who are 100% Irish, 100% Norwegian. Because of their heritage, what their people eat, should there be a groups of food they should eat as vegan if they were to go vegan that they're uh, whatever eat? And part, second part of that question, oh. somebody who has genetic issues like me, sickness, fibrosis, other people, are there foods they should eat as vegans? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, my husband is a high-performance endurance athlete, and one of the things that has come up frequently in our household, because we strive to be whole food plant-based, um, is the idea of supplementation with regards to, and I know Rich and I were able to speak about this briefly before, but with regards to some level of protein intake, specifically for him when he's in season and training. Um, and then for me, I found out recently, um, Michelle, that I'm extremely B12 deficient, and so, preferring to do plant-based options to bring B12 into my diet versus supplementing. So just supplementation question mark in general is the <laughs> when and how do you feel the need to supplement? Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, um, this is uh, for David. We had a chance to chat earlier about my son who's a ex -high, high school football player. Um, right now I've been vegan for six months and um, my husband and my son are not. I always get the bacon though, you know. Um, I'm sure everybody here has heard that one. Um, I just, and you mentioned that your wife was vegan bef excuse me, before you decided to make the lifestyle change. And I guess my question is how much should you push? How much can you push? With my daughter, she kind of started with me. She was like, oh, there's pigs, they're so cute. I'm not eating pig pork anymore. And then it kind of went into milk and then eggs. And now <laughs> she's down to, um, only eating two-legged animals. So, I mean, I, it's a process. I mean, it's slow, and I don't want to push her too much. And it's, it's again, I don't know um, how much to push, how far to go. And I find myself having to cook two meals yeah. um, a lot of the times. Thank you, know. you so yeah, Oh, go ahead. I didn't no, that was it. Off. So that was basically like how much can you push, should you push. Or yeah. So we're going to go through the questions. So that's really tied to the earlier questions yeah. as well about how do you convince people, how do you speak to non-vegans, how do you approach them, and how do you talk to your loved ones about it? Um, children, something, yeah. excuse, excuse and me? And children. Mostly. And children, yeah. exactly, yeah. You can't sit them down in front of, you know, cowspiracy or earthlings. Or you can, yeah. and then. I mean, you can, <laughs> but <laughs> you got to deal with the nightmares afterwards, you know? Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. So we're going to go to ritual. If you were Surgeon General tomorrow, what would you do? 
It's funny, that question germinates out of the fact that on my podcast, for those that don't know, I'm, uh, when I have a doctor on my podcast, I always conclude our conversation by asking that question. I think I asked <laughs> yeah. Dr. McMacken that very question. Yeah. So here. Um, at the risk of sounding completely idealistic, uh, I think that what I would do is um, focus my efforts and do everything that I could to first uh, work to um, to end uh, farm subsidies. I think that that is a huge problem in our food system yeah. to balance out uh, mm -hmm. the economics of our food system. Uh, I would equally work hard to, uh, to, not to the extent that I would have the power to do so, but to the extent that I could exercise some influence over campaign finance reform yes. so that we can get all of the money that's coming from the Monsantos and the big pharma companies that's flowing into our representatives to stop or to change or be reduced, I think would have a profound impact on what our health care system looks like and our farm system as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm Bernie all the way. Uh, lobbying is a big problem. I think change uh, happens in two ways. It happens from the top down and it happens from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. So as Surgeon General, I would focus on the, the top down stuff that I just mentioned. But I think in terms of bottom up, you've got you to focus energies and funds towards, um, towards developing communities, right, to end this food desert program, problem that we have. Uh, and I think you need to work towards making healthy choices more convenient. So there's a program. Uh, there's a guy called Dan Butner. He wrote a book called The Blue Zones, and he's turned this into a program that he mm -hmm. takes to cities across America where he gets involved in city politics and helps change policy and infrastructure in cities to improve health. And that goes from everything from school lunch to bike paths and beyond. And so what I, I think would be cool would be to create a federal program around that so that more cities could have access to this, these kinds of programs that could improve things. I would create grants and financing available to creating community gardens to mm -hmm. uh, aim towards this food desert program. And I would also funnel money towards programs like what Dr. McMacken is doing and her colleague uh, Dr. Osfeld are doing, mm -hmm. which is basically mm -hmm. educating uh, underserved communities on how to you know, become healthy and take control of their health. Uh, yeah, I could go on and on and on, but I think that would be a good start. Yeah, great. Preventive medicine. Really. Thank you. Right. The second question, Michelle, was about recommended foods. Uh, if you're going vegan uh, and those that are dealing with um, cystic fibrosis or other disorders, that's a big question. So I think there's, there's definitely um, people talk about do different cultures or do, do people have different biologies around food? And I want to say that they don't. Uh, people benefit from uh, th the same foods. So it's not like one person because of their culture, their heritage, their genes needs one type of food or their blood type needs one type of food. Uh, <laughs> we all benefit from the same foods and across the board, it's very hard to argue with the fact that we, do, we benefit from plant foods. We benefit from whole grains, we benefit from legumes, fruits and vegetables and some nuts and seeds in our diet. So as far as specific conditions, you know, there's, there's very little that has, in which plant-based diets, fully whole food plant-based diets have been studied that haven't been shown um, to, to uh, have a benefit. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Number one, it's the absence of harmful foods in the diet where you are, um, there's hormones coming from the outside, whether they're hormone-free or not, there's still hormones in the food. Um, antibiotics in the diet, and I was actually going to talk about that earlier, the intersection between human health and animal health and all the antibiotic resistance that we have that's related to the antibiotics in our food, uh, in mostly in animal products. Um, and we're, you're also removing foods that raise internal hormone levels like IGF-1, which is a hormone that is, goes up, sort of skyrockets up when we eat dairy products and meat. Um, which is very closely linked with cancer. So you're removing a lot of those foods that are very inflammatory, uh, that are associated with hardening of the arteries and cholesterol deposits. Uh, and then you're, at the same time, flooding your body with foods that are filled with antioxidants and phytonutrients that really help the body function the way it's supposed to. Your body has an innate ability to heal itself. We just have to let it. 
We just have to remove the things that are not allowing us to heal and give ourselves the nutrients that we need to heal. Thank you. So the next question <laughs> was for both Rich and Michelle. Uh, endurance athletes, how do they supplement well as vegans if they are plant-based? And uh, I believe, who was that that had asked the question? Was that uh, right? B12 deficient? Was that? Yeah, the question was also about B12 deficiency. So Michelle, would you like to start and then Rich pick up? Well, I, I'll address the B12 part of it, just because I feel pretty strongly that uh, people should not rely on food to get their B12. I really feel like people should take a supplement. That's the one place where if you're following a fully plant-based diet, a vegan diet, you really need a supplement. Uh, yes, you can get some B12 from your food, but it's not fully reliable, and you're doing yourself a disservice if you let your levels get low, uh, which can be reverse, irreversible um, at a certain point. So. Uh, we can, without getting into the details of which supplement, um, there's information readily available online and a number of quite reputable sources um, about how much to take. But um, I do recommend supplementation of B12. That's the one supplement I think everyone should take. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, I like what Dominic had to say about this. I mean, look at this guy. He doesn't supplement <laughs> at all. The dude is super ripped, you know, and completely <laughs> fit. And that upends this whole conversation about protein and deficiencies, et cetera. You know, and I, and I think, you know, when I began this journey and, and I was trying to become an athlete once again, and I was terrified of being deficient or not meeting my protein needs and all of this, and, and I had a, a, a cabinet that was just packed with su all kinds of supplements, you know, because I was so scared that I wasn't going to be, you know, meeting my needs. And over the years, I really weaned myself off of all of it, basically. And, you know, still, I'm not as far as Dominic, but, like, he inspires me. Like, you know, I don't, why, why am I putting protein powder in, in this thing? Because I think that I need it. Do I really need it? You know, what's really going on? And so when someone says, well, I got to, you know, like, I'm pushing myself really hard, and I need, you know, I got to get my X number of grams of protein afterwards, and I'm not going to be able to do that on a plant-based diet, I think first we have to question the, you know, whether that's actually a true statement. Um, how much protein do you really need? Uh, you know, are you saying you need that because someone else told you that? Is that truly what you need? Is this done through self-experimentation? And, and go from there. Now, I'm not, I don't mean to vilify all supplements if you're deficient in something. And I think, you know, with our soils being depleted, it's easier and easier to become deficient in certain things. And it's important to have your blood work done and, and to pay attention to that. But I think the focus should always be on real whole foods. That's where you get your nutrients from. If you feel, if, you're, if you are deficient in something or you feel like you're not getting everything that you need from your diet because you didn't eat enough or you didn't eat properly that day, then I have no problem with supplementing with a little plant-based protein in your smoothie. It's not a big deal, but I think the important thing is to not um, think of that as the focus and the, the main place that you're getting your nutrition. Thank you so much. Those are really good answers. David, I believe the last question was for you. How do you push <laughs> others in your family to be vegan or follow a vegan lifestyle? Or how much do you push, um, and in particular with your uh, children and significant others? Okay. Well, I don't have any kids, but I'm going to give you the best answer I can. Um, if you, when you approach people with, about becoming vegan and you want them to become vegan, especially your family members for health reasons, you have to be very careful because... When you do approach them with it, vegans have a tendency to attack or be on the like the pedestal, as you say. So, yeah, when you approach them about it, you're attacking the way of their way of life because they feel guilty about it for eating meat anyway because they know like, well, you know, I'm not supposed to be eating it. So, and so you have to like he said, meet them where they're at. Like just introduce them to it. Or what I like to do is I like to take people to vegan restaurants. You know, just try this out or try this garden meat or something. Just something just to help them to buffer their, their journey to a plant-based diet to make them see that, okay, there are other options out there. It's not, because a lot of people who are, who are meat eaters, they automatically assume when they hear vegan, you know, salads and rice and beans, and that's it. There's nothing else. They don't have, they guys don't have burgers, nothing. You guys are just salads and rabbits out there. And, um, you know, you have to educate them. That's one, Edu meet them where they're at, educate them, and then also, too, you have to take into consideration that people who eat meat and dairy, and a lot of, uh, they're addicted. There's an addictive quality. And uh, like she said, the antibiotics and stuff in the meat, um, milk has casomorphine in it. And that is the same thing. It's like regular morphine. It's just as addictive. You don't have all the, 
you know, you don't get the, the feeling, but it's still addicting, like more like, you know, that's why you have to wean a baby off of a breast milk when, you know, when you're breastfeeding a baby, you have to wean them off because the case of morphine makes them want that milk. And when we're eating cheese and you see a cheese commercial with like people, they see pizza commercials and the cheese is dripping. That's why they put so much, such heavy emphasis on the cheese in the commercial is because they're selling that addictive quality, that cheese to you. And it's triggering something in your brain to make you, oh, I want some cheese. That's why it's always, that's why in that post that I said, mm -hmm. you know, if you can't give up uh, meat, I mean, if you can't give up cheese, just eat everything else. You can still eat everything else vegan and you still eat cheese eventually, they'll come around. But it's, you have to educate them on that and why they like cheese so much, why, what's going on in the meat and dairy industry. And once you educate yourself and you have that knowledge, then, you know, then, you know, you can't be ignorant anymore. Some people, if you know, if you see what's really happening in the world, they can no longer be ignorant. And if they are, then, then they're going to have a problem. They're going to hit rock bottom, like like my, my guy over here, and they'll, they'll come around eventually. So, um, yeah, don't force them. Meet them where they're at. Take them to a restaurant, a vegan restaurant, and just make it like make make it a game. Like I, I challenge you, I'll give, I'll challenge you, or I bet you a hundred dollars you can't go vegan for a week, for two weeks, <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll do it. But but it, it's a hundred dollars that you'll be out of your pocket because they'll they'll do it. But at the end of that week, just imagine how much they've learned in that week and how how what they what their body's going to feel differently in that week and what they what they'll take from that. So, and that's what I do. I take football players to vegan restaurants all the time, and at the end of the, the end of the dinner, they're like, "I'm gonna try it for a week. I'm gonna do it for two months. I'm going vegan for life." And it happens all the time. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> L.A. It is, is full of vegan restaurants. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank so. you so much, David. Thank you. The people up here just solved climate change and erectile dysfunction and well and fell swoop. <laughs> Who knew? And why you had that much to offer. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much for attending. Please come speak to everybody um, at the book signing and at, um, at Dominic's table as well. We're really, really excited. There are two more events, Seafood as Animals uh, and Literature uh, and the Environment or the Anthropocene. Please come. We are so excited to see you. Thank you. Thank you.